Hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogitas. I'm Phil Ramsey, uh, and this is where we have this Bible Truth series, as, uh, um, as my wife so eloquently named it. Um, and so we go through the Bible, chapter and verse, basically, um, to get a hold of who God is, why He wrote this word, um, mainly, again, to help parents um, to, uh, I mean, it can this can benefit anybody, the Bible can benefit anybody, but we're looking through to kind of laser focus to help parents read the word to their kids. It's so important to pass this on um, because if we don't, we'll see exactly what's going on in this nation now where you have an entire generation who has no idea um, why any of this is important. And so um, this nation, I fear, is going the same path that Egypt is go went when we, we read about it. Um, there's a lot of similarities. You probably noticed it when I uh, talked about it in um, yesterday's video, which uh, if you did not see, I suggest highly that you go back and see it because this essentially is a is a part two of that one. Um, even though it's not a message, it's like a, like a series. I mean, it, the whole thing is a series because we're going through the Bible. But um, this is uh, in, in important, you know, to understand some of those principles that God has laid out. The fact that He judges nations differently than He judges people. A nation can is a man made structure that's that that you know, goes about its own way, if it gets away from acknowledging God, then God will judge that nation. If a nation stays honoring God, then God will bless that nation. But if they turn away from God, then God will begin to bring judgment against that nation. And if people uh, don't acknowledge, I mean, the, the, even if the nation does not acknowledge God and turn back, there are still, there will always be people who do. And they'll come out of there, just like God told um, in Revelation, to a future a future nation, a future city of Babylon, God says, come out of her, my people, lest you share her judgments. Anybody who is willing to accept Jesus, God counts as one of his people. If they, if they accept Jesus, they're one of his people. And so, um, because God, would, God uh, would love to redeem all of humanity to himself, but because he gave us free will, not everybody will. So, um, we talked about how God is, you know, bringing judgment not only against the nation of, of Egypt, but against the different gods that Egypt has replaced uh, God with. They have taken all these elements of life, the fertility, the crops, the, you know, protection, this and that, and they have uh, made themselves a pantheon of gods uh, who, you know, are actually demons because over in um, 1 Corinthians, Paul explains that Anybody, you know, if the worship of idols is actually the worship of demons. That's why there's some supernatural things that come along with it. That's why they think, hey, this is working because they can get some supernatural things. Well, just because of something is supernatural doesn't mean it came from God. And so uh, God is displaying his mastery um, over everything that they have set up to replace him. And so uh, here in chapter 10 of Exodus, God's continuing this judgment because Pharaoh is not listening not letting the people go. So, uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 10, Then the Lord said to Moses, Return to Pharaoh and make your demands again. I have made him and his officials stubborn, so I can display my miraculous signs against them. God did harden Pharaoh's heart one time. Every other time, Pharaoh has hardened his own heart. God will harden Pharaoh's heart again. But again, God gives people over to whatever that they're, they're going after instead of him. But it doesn't happen right away. First, people have to uh, display this and, and continue with it and then eventually, you know, if they make a pattern of hardening their heart against God, eventually he will give them over to that and, and in doing so, he hardens their heart, essentially, but even if they have, even with a hard heart, they can turn back. We talked about that. Nowhere does it say that God took away Pharaoh's choice. Okay, verse 1 of chapter 10. Then the Lord, oh yeah, we read that again. Uh, I have made him my, my, his official stubborn so I can display my miraculous signs among them. Why? So the other nations who are watching all of this can understand because this is, this is going to spread by word of mouth. People are going to say, wow, this Egyptian superpower was brought low by, by Almighty God. Maybe we should pay attention to God so it doesn't happen to us. Verse 2, God says, I've also done it so you can tell your children and grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and about the signs I displayed among them. So you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to submit to me? Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse, watch out. For tomorrow I will bring a swarm of locusts on your country. They will cover the land so that you won't be able to see the ground. 
They will devour what little is left of your crops after the hailstorm, including all the trees growing in the fields. They will overrun your palaces and the homes of your officials and all the houses in Egypt. Never in the history of Egypt have your ancestors seen a plague like this one. And with that, Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials now came to Pharaoh and appealed to him. How long will you let this man hold us hostage? Let the men go to worship the Lord their God. Don't you realize that Egypt lies in ruins? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. All right, he told them, go and worship the Lord your God. But who exactly will be going with you? See, here's the world try, seeks to compromise with God. The world wants, well, God, well, okay, God, you're going to have to meet us part way here. God doesn't have to meet anybody part way. He's God. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is one of the reasons we love God. Now, um, verse 9, Moses replied, We will all go, young and old, our sons and daughters, and our flocks and herds. We must all join together in celebrating a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh retorted, The Lord will certainly need to be with you if I let you take your little ones. I can see through your evil plan. Never. Only the men may go and worship the Lord, since that is what you requested. And Pharaoh threw them out of the palace. Then Pharaoh said to, the, then the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the land of Egypt to bring on the locusts. Let them cover the land and devour every plant that survived the hailstorm. This is a judgment against uh, the Egyptians' god of crops, but they also had a god of, that was a protector of their crops. Their crops were very important then. They were a farming community, um, a farming nation, and it was through grain that they were able to, uh, you know... So historically, if you, if you study history, uh, nations that understood how to properly apply grain were able to raise armies very quickly. And so that is the gateway to being, becoming a superpower, the ability to control foodstuffs. Um, you know, war is economics. So anyway, um, God is going to display his mastery over this too. Look, I, I you know, you're, you, you're trusting in your crops for, to maintain your, your power? No. No, God's going to show how awesome he is again. So Moses raised his staff over Egypt. This is verse 13. And the Lord caused an east wind to blow over the land all that day and through the night. When morning arrived, the east wind had brought the locusts. And the locusts swarmed over the whole land of Egypt, settling in dense swarms from one end of the country to the other. It was the worst locust plague in Egyptian history, and there has never been another one like it. For the locusts covered the whole country and darkened the land. They devoured every plant in the fields and all the fruit on the trees that had survived the hailstorm. Not a single leaf was left on the trees and plants throughout the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you, he confessed. Forgive my sin just this once and plead with the Lord your God to take away this death from me. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and pleaded with the, with the Lord. The Lord responded by shifting the wind, and the strong west wind blew the locusts into the sea. Not a single locust remained in all the land of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again, so he refused to let the people go. And I mean, the word doesn't exactly say this, but, but it could have been possible, just like some of the people um, with the plague of the hail acknowledged and said, maybe, maybe we ought to listen to what this God is saying, and they brought, they brought their livestock in. Um, it's possible that they went out and collected some fruit and stuff before the locusts landed. Maybe they had some supplies. Um, locusts themselves are edible. Um, so even in the even in the plague, there's mercy. I mean, they could have gathered a bunch of locusts to eat before God blew them out into the sea. So, verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be, be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time, the people could not see each other, and no one moved. But there was light, as usual, where the people of Israel lived. This was a judgment against the Egyptian god Ra. Most, uh, most people, anybody who's watched the Egyptian documentaries have probably heard of Ra. He was the most worshipped god in Egypt, and uh, he was the sun god. And so, you know, coming, I mean, I grew up in the desert, you know, uh, you, can, you, can, you can walk out in the desert sun, you can feel it on your skin, and when you have a complexion like mine, you can actually feel your skin burning. And so, this darkness so thick that you can feel it, I know, I, I know at least the other side of what God is talking about. I, can I mean, I can go out in the sun and I can feel, feel that heat, I can feel that, you know. Um, and so God is, this is again, complete mastery. I mean, I've seen depictions of, of this plague in movies and stuff where they, they show, oh, it's a, it was a lunar eclipse. And no, you can still see during a lunar eclipse. 
this is a supernatural darkness. It's a darkness that's only that only the Egyptians are experiencing and feeling because it said it was light as normal where the Hebrews lived. So once again, God is making this distinction. So the plague is actually a blessing to the Hebrews, but it's a curse to the Egyptians. And if the Egyptians would just, if they would just turn and worship God, then they would no longer be a part of this. And and it's it, God's covenant is not. Um, he he has he has yet to 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 put out to put out the bullet points or the the um, the entry point into the covenant, but he you'll see that he 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 doesn't kill any of the Egyptians with these plagues, and then there's an entry point into into covenant with him even for the Egyptians, and we'll get there, probably not now, but we will get there. I mean not not in this in this reading, but okay. So now uh, verse twenty four. Finally, Pharaoh called for Moses. Go and worship the Lord, he said, but leave your flocks and herds here. You may even take your little ones with you. No, Moses said, you must provide us with animals for sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord our God. All our livestock must go with us, too. Not a hoof can be left behind. I like that. We must choose our sacrifices for the Lord our God from among these animals, and we don't know how we are to worship the Lord until we get there. They haven't even got their instructions about how to worship God yet. All they know is God's calling us to go out there and worship Him. You know, God may have a call on your life that you don't understand. I don't understand the, de the details. God has called me to go here to this place that I don't even know anybody. Yeah, you don't know the details yet, but that doesn't matter. If you follow what God has said and you follow His timing, then everything will, will be there right when you need it, right where you're going. Verse 27. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart once more. See, this is another time God's hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he would not let them go. Pharaoh, uh, get out of here, Pharaoh shouted at Moses. I'm warning you, never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Very well, Moses replied, I will never see your face again. And so, uh, God still did not take away Pharaoh's choice. Yes, it was a very hard decision for Pharaoh, and he chose to go the way of hardness rather than listening. Um, and this probably has to, something to do with the fact that God has just brought judgment against the, the greatest God of Egypt. Verse 11. I mean, chapter 11, excuse me. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will strike Pharaoh and the land of Egypt with one more blow. After that, Pharaoh will let you leave this country. In fact, he will be so eager to get rid of you that he will force you all to leave. Tell all the Israelite men and women to ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Now the Lord had caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the people of Israel, and Moses was considered to be a very great man in the land of Egypt, respected by Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptians alike, Egyptian people alike. Moses had announced to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, At midnight tonight I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. This is why it's so, it's so important to understand God is about to set up a covenant and he's about to allow um, the Egyptians to take part in it if they want to. And so he is saying, I make a distinction between my people and so those who follow me will be blessed. Those who do not are cursed. It's like um, Joshua told the people later on when they were after they had gone into the land that God promised them, and he said, "Today I put before you." Actually, maybe I think Joshua did say that, but I think Moses also said it too. Today I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing, uh, and God doesn't say which one that you should that that he is. He doesn't give a command to choose life or choose death, but he gives a hint: choose life, choose life that you might live. And uh, so he's like, I'm making a distinction. And now this this judgment against um, Egypt, this firstborn, this is actually retribution against Pharaoh because this is the same Pharaoh, uh, or no, actually it's not. But it's the, he 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 continued this harsh brutality of the Egypt of the of the Israelites, but the Pharaoh back uh, that um, was there when Moses was growing up had killed all the the Hebrew firstborn males. God is not killing all of uh, Egypt's males. He's only killing the firstborn. And that is his judgment against that action. That, and it was, I mean, it's, because it's not just Pharaoh. Pharaoh, yeah, may have made the command, but his people followed it. And so there was 
blood on the Egyptians' hands. And so this is retribution here, and even, but he, again, even in the judgment, there's mercy. Uh, Pharaoh didn't have to continue on here. Then God would not have struck down the firstborn. Yeah, God hardened his heart, but he didn't take away Pharaoh's choice. The other side is that God is, is meeting out this judgment, and they are simply reaping what they have sown. Um, and so the way out was if they had listened to God, but they didn't listen to God. And so they have to, they're, God is bringing about this judgment, this retribution. Okay, so, um, verse 8. All the Egypt officials of Egypt will run to me and fall to the ground before me. Please leave, they will beg. Hurry and take all your followers with you. Only then will I go. Then burning with anger, Moses left Pharaoh. Why is Moses angry? Because Pharaoh's not listening. And Moses, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's court. He doesn't want to see the Egyptians die either. He's mad because Pharaoh's not listening. Verse 9. Now the Lord had told Moses earlier, Pharaoh will not listen to you. But then I will do even more mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed these miracles in Pharaoh's presence, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he wouldn't let the Israelites leave the country. So that's kind of a, a zoom-out moment where it just kind of gives us an overview. Uh, and so this is uh, important to understand uh, how God operates. Uh, and because there's so many things all happening at the same time, this, these, the, these plagues are against the nation of Egypt, but still you find warnings and mercy within the plagues to the individual people, and some of them heed it, some of them don't. Um, the, the, the plagues are coming again. I mean, the, the judgments are against the gods that they have chosen for themselves, the Shadim, as, as the Hebrew uh, renders it, and the worship of demons who have been deceiving the people, and God is now opening their eyes to the reality of, look, these gods don't govern these things. I do. And beyond that... Um, you know, there is some significance in numbers of things. Um, you know, you don't want to get too far into numerology and all that. Just, I mean, that's just a, uh, a piece of advice. You don't want to get too, because you can overanalyze that and get yourself into all kinds of messed up stuff. But, but God does use, God does use numbers to symbolize things. Uh, the number 10 symbolizes government of man. And so this is a completion then of these plagues because God brings it out to ten plagues. It's a, it's a completion of, of the plagues against, or the judgment against the nation of Egypt that has set itself against God's ways. Because, again, ten is that number of government. Uh, Twelve was the number of perfect government. There's a reason that there were twelve tribes of Israel. There's a reason that there was uh, twelve disciples. Uh, God is using numbers to symbolize things um, you know, but it's just a symbol. It's just a. It's just a type. It's a shadow of something that has a deeper significance behind it. And so, uh, it's important to understand that. That um, what, what? What? How am I on time? Just out of curiosity. Um, two minutes. Oh, I still got two minutes. Um, yeah. And so this turned out to be a short one. I didn't want to. I don't want to go any further, um, because we'll be getting. It would take probably 15 minutes to do this, you know, 10, 15 minutes to do the next chapter. So uh, let's go ahead and, and, and cut this one a little short. And I'm going to pray for all of you. Um, so let me just set myself up here. Father God, I lift up everyone here who uh, tunes into these videos. Lord, I thank you um, for the understanding that's uh, coming into our hearts that it's about this continual inputting of your word into our hearts, Lord, uh, that brings about the change that we are looking for, Lord God. Put it in our heart to, uh, even in an even greater way, show us the importance of passing this on to our kids, passing this on to others, and uh, give everyone a, a, um, the ability to, to say what they should, uh, to speak what, uh, what is needed in the moment. You know, the Word talks about that right word in due season. Uh, help us to not get caught up in um, certain doctrines that, that are not um, the main thing, the main focus that you are focusing on. Uh, in other, it help us to not major on the minors, Lord God, but to put them in their proper place, uh, to, um, to look at what is important, what, what are you interested in, Father God, which is, of course is the lost. You, you're, you're shining, you were shining your light back there in Egypt, uh, trying to get those people to understand your ways and try to, to see how merciful and how good you really are. 
And um, even now, you're still doing that in these days that we live in. And sometimes people misunderstand that, God. Sometimes people um, take a, a sign of mercy as, oh, um, I'm okay doing what I'm doing. But really, all you're doing is trying to be nice. You're trying to be nice. You're trying to be um, uh, just and, and good and show them what they should be doing. And sometimes people misunderstand that, Lord God. And so I pray, Father God, that you help us all to understand these things, help us to commit them to our heart. Um, and I pray a blessing. I pray your blessing over everybody who, who tunes in here, Lord God. Bless them for that. Um, help them to continue to be faithful in tuning in, Lord God, as long as, as is needed according to your desire and what you are telling their heart. And I thank you, Father God, and in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Okay, bless you guys, and uh, we will see you again.